Everybody is Anthony Brogdon, and I'm coming at you once again. And check me out this time, my friends. I'm being tag team by a husband and wife team. Man, they come both of them coming on me. It won't be long before you see two faces on the screen, two beautiful brothers and sisters married in matrimony. Black on black love. We, that's what we got tonight on uh, today or wherever you watch this on Strong Inspirations. Watch out, because they, 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 let me tell you what happened was, he came on the channel some time ago and had some really nice black history stories that he shared. And, uh, amazing stuff like, hey man, let me tell you, I picked cotton. My father was a sharecropper. I remember the video very well, mm -hmm. like it was yesterday. So I guess she was watching and she said, hold on, man, I got something to say too. <laughs> I can't let you hold this. I got some history. And so here we are with the, uh, with the better half of the other half. How about that? Ain't that what they say? Amen. Uh, check it out. Uh, we jamming here at Strong Inspirations because somehow people are catching on to this because the train has left the station. And they are saying, we want to come on. We want to tell our story because we want people to hear it. And that's what the channel is all about. It's about these stories. I, I don't know how else to put it. They facts, they stories, uh, but it's what has happened. And so here we are. And it's coming from around the world. Have you noticed that video I got out of South Africa? The video I got out of Ireland? Oh man, I couldn't believe it. She said some of the, the largest plantation owners were some Irish people. How mm -hmm. about the one from um, South Africa? My man said, I've lived through apartheid. And guess what I come to notice after uh, un, uh, really focusing in on what he said? Apartheid wasn't but the same thing as Jim Crow, everybody. It was just a different term. And because we in America, we made it sound different. Same thing. Uh, I, I, come on, my friends, hit the subscribe button on the channel. I'm gonna keep doing it until you do. And then I'm gonna do it some more, a lot more. I'm having fun. Hit the like button on this video. Watch the sister gonna tell you something that's gonna blow your mind. Hit the notifications bell so when the videos come up, you get a ding or something like that on your computer that says, hey, Strong Inspirations just, just came at you with some new content. And then tell somebody about Strong Inspirations. I know y'all sitting there watching it because I got some people every now and then, they say, man, I've been watching you for a while. Man, how I know? Send me a message. Tell me how you like it. What I can do to improve it. I have no problems with a little bit of criticism. I, I got no, I got no issue because I want to get good at this. I'm an ordinary guy doing something different. A couple more things. I've been telling you, I'm going to Kansas City, Kansas. That's May 27th through the 29th with my own festival. I want a thousand of y'all to come and meet me there. And I'm telling you, it's going to be well organized and we're going to rock and roll. You're going to enjoy this. And I, I just came up with this. I call it a Black History Festival. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to call it. It's a Black History because that's really what the focus is. Understanding how them enslaved brothers and sisters walked across that Missouri River to get to Quindaro, Kansas. Come, come check me out. It's going to be very reasonable price. You got to get there. And then the hotel, I'm getting all that set up right now. And I'll be releasing that information in the very near future. So you have enough time to get your airfare together, to get your, dry, your gas to dry. And then to get you a few dollars once you get there for your lodging. I'll feed you good food. And uh, and you you know shop with the vendors and the and the businesses in that town. The other thing I want you to do, my friends, and I know my numbers is up, is watch my movie. My numbers is up. I, a lot of people are watching this. I can feel it. It's called Business in the Black: The Rise of Black Business in America. 
how slaves went to college and black millionaires in the 1800s. Watch this, it's a very good documentary. Not because I did it, but other people have told me that. And then read my book. It's called Black Business Book. The book is good. Not because I wrote it, but somebody else said it. That what they really did say is they thought it was the most comprehensive, easy to read Black history book they've run across. Because I cover a ton of stuff. I got 17 chapters in this book. It's a little bit of everything. And why it is the way it is, is because I don't give you no commentary. I just give you the facts and let the facts stand on its own merit. And because some of them is kind of unbelievable, I give you the link where I found them. Check me out. Do that. That's that's my way of making a living. All right, everybody. So now you hear me use that term strong a lot. In my world, strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. My guest is sis. <laughs> it's really two of them. Watch, he gonna stick his head in there. He gonna stick his head in. It's two of them. I got two guests. He's back there laughing and everything. Y'all here? That's a tag team. That's a beautiful couple. And I'm gonna let her do some talking just a second. Watch out. Here she go. Boom. Shaka Laka is your turn, lady. Please. Hi, everyone. I'm glad to um, be joining you, Anthony. I've talked with you on the phone before, and I know you've spoken with Floyd and some other people from St. Augustine, Florida, um, one of our other um, friends that we represent in our museum also who was involved with the civil rights movement here, Jimmy Jackson, you've had on. But my name is Regina Gale Phillips. I'm the executive director of the Lincolnville Museum in St. Augustine, Florida. Yeah. And we cover a lot of history. You okay, say hold on. You know, I do interrupt. I do interrupt. Now nah, then, come on now. Nah, check it out. I don't mean no disrespect. I got to talk about you for a second. Just a second. Okay. Where'd you grow up? I actually grew up uh, not very far from here in Duval County, Florida, in a little town, little area called Mandarin. Mandarin is right uh, along the St. John's River. It's in the southernmost part of Duval County. And the next county over is St. John's County, which is where St. Augustine is. Then Mandarin has its own history, um, which you know we have an exhibit that's gonna be opening near. Um, actually, we're having a preview next week for the African-American history for Mandarin that's gonna be coming out. Um, but my involvement here is with the St. Augustine and Lincolnville history, cause that's what I do. Yeah, now hold on, what you say that has its own history. Uh, you got some stories you can share about what has happened there? <laughs> In Mandarin, well, Mandarin is, um, you know, was a little area. It wasn't even a town. It was a part of town. What used to be Mandarin was old Mandarin where I grew up, which was basically, you know, um, kind of like a, a bedroom community to Jacksonville where a lot of older, rich white people lived and some poor black people lived. And so it was a it was rural. It was it was called the country when I grew up there. So we had one two lane road that was paved and no red lights. And now there's a eight lane uh, uh, the same street that was one paved road is now eight lanes and you know there's a red light on every block and it's become like the boom town of Duval County. So it was, so was was it a, a farm that you grew up on? I did. Yeah, I did. I grew up on a 10 acre family farm and um, not a farm. Well, I guess you could call it a truck farm. We didn't have animals, but we did have other than chickens, but we had um, a lot of produce that we grew. We grew our own watermelon, corn, sweet potatoes. What else did we grow? Peas, strawberries. Yeah. Lovely strawberries. Uh, my grandmother was a farmer. She actually came she and my uh, grandfather came to Florida pretty much at the turn of the uh, 20th century from South Carolina, from a little place called Ritter, South Carolina. They came to St. Augustine, I guess following the news that St. Augustine had been a place where black people had some freedom. Okay, I got to stay on this farm because I'm, 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 I'm I don't know nothing about that. Farm, Let me ask you, as a farmer, how do you farm? You, 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 you toil the soil, you know, get it ready, you put the seeds down, and you sit and wait. Is that all it is? Well, I don't think so. I was a kid. Remember this now. I'm only okay. 
five. So, um, but as, as a child, what we did is we did have to, uh, we had a man that used to come uh, and he would plow the field when it was time for, you know, getting it prepared for planting. And then we still had to go in and form up the rows. And then we would go in as little children, you know, there were a whole lot of us. I'm the youngest of 13 oh, and we really? would make our little holes and put the seeds in there. And then we had to carry the water. We did not have running water when I was growing up, which is, you know, most people don't relate to that. I'm only right. 65, but, you know, I can remember we had a pump that you had to prime and you pumped it. And we had like a little, you know, assembly line where we were carrying buckets to the field to water the seeds, you know, until they germinated and, you know, plants came up. Okay, hold on, man, sure is that. Okay, you said they had to plant. When you plant, they never just, Throwing them, up, throwing them in the hole, right? And putting dirt on them. And somebody come and cover the hole up. So you had to do row after row after row of that. Yeah. But we were kids. <laughs> I got you. So that wasn't such bad work then, maybe. Okay, that's another story. <laughs> let, let me ask you this. When, how, what, okay, in such a, a small town and, and rural like that, what do you do every day? You know what I mean? Because, I, I mean, I got... You know, I grew up in a big city, so I got places to go. What? Well, like I said, we had a lot of relatives. I had um, nieces and nephews and older siblings. And so we played softball in our, we had, you know, big space. So we could play ball, whatever season it was, whether it was, you know, softball or basketball, or we played school, we played the Supremes in our backyard and we did, we made up our own fun. We ran through the woods and made tree houses and rode pine trees like that. we were the Lone Ranger and we did all kinds of things. Oh, I love it. Ourselves. I love it. It, I'm gonna stay on this just a little bit longer because I, I want people to hear these stories who might not know like I don't. What um, did is how, how do you go to school? You 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 stand outside the the, the house and a bus come pick you up that kind of thing. The bus, yeah, the bus came actually right in front of our house. We were lucky because it stopped right in front of our house, but some kids had to walk maybe half a mile to get to the bus stop. Because they so you you got on that rickety yellow bus going yeah, and coming. Absolutely. Um, how many kids were? How far was the bus ride? Ooh, about thirty miles. Actually, Ooh, that's a long bus ride. A long bus ride. We had to pass other schools. You know, still part of the segregated South at that point in time. So okay, we had to go from Mandarin. Uh, which, like I said, is on the extreme south end. And sometimes we had to go through other little areas to pick up kids from other areas. Sometimes they had their own bus, and sometimes, you know, if their bus broke down, our bus had to go to those areas as well. So the bus ride itself might be an hour. So, so you had to get up at what time to be ready for school at what time? I think the bus came sometimes 6.30 in the morning. Really? You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then you didn't get to school till almost 7.30, 8 o'clock yeah. or something. Yeah. And then and, and that's a long ride. It's uh, a long ride. And then we had to go not just to one school because the same bus since it was picking up all the children from the neighborhood uh, on elementary school bus. You know, um, we went to the elementary school and then it went to the high school, which was at that point, there was one high school for blacks in my area. Later, it would pick up kids from our neighborhood, and this is after the schools were integrated, and we would go to different schools. So it would go like to the junior high school where I went, and then it would go to the high school. And because we got out a half an hour earlier than the high school, we started a half an hour earlier and got out a half an hour earlier that we would have to just sit on the bus and wait until that school got out. And then we sometimes would have to make that long trek around the different neighborhoods. Um, oh my God. Let yeah. me ask you, so uh, on this bus, it's all black kids. Mm -hmm. All black. So y'all oh, know that now. something ain't right about this picture. We got to go past the white boy school. The school yeah. might be bigger. They look happy and all that to get to your school. Yeah. Yeah, the schools weren't integrated until I think 69. So I went to junior high school in an integrated school. 
Okay, let me ask you this question. How does that make you feel? Does that make you feel inferior? Does that give you some sense of hate for them? What does that do for your psychic man? No, I think that um, I don't, I can't say I hate. I think, you know, I hate the system that I still think is very um, structured and uh, unjust in a lot of ways, but I can't say I hate all of the people. I can't hate the kids that are in the school. I did not have um, the sensibility that I have now as a child. Right. Obviously, you know, you're sheltered somewhat and ignorant a lot about a lot of things. But um, I, you know, we all knew it was unjust that we had to pass this school to go to another school. And of course, you know, you had to go to the library and get the books that were used sometimes you know, tattered that you got in your library that had stamps still left on them from other schools where they had been, you know. Um, really? Yes, yeah. Do, do you think you got a good, ed, as good of education or good education uh, if, as far as you can imagine by comparison? I think that we had some excellent teachers. I love where, it. I only went to first through sixth grade in a segregated school. I love it. Okay. And so when, by the time I got to junior high school, it was an integrated situation. But I have to say, I, I think I've always been, you get you get what you give or you get what you go to get. I got you. I got you. So, you know, even in our segregated schools, we had some students that were brighter than other students and we had some classes that were better than other classes, some teachers that were- I got you, I love it. They still put, you know, the ACT UP students in certain classes and the more progressive students in, in different classes. And I was fortunate that I was in some classes where teachers were serious about teaching. I and got you. Classroom and made sure that, you know, we um, applied ourselves. Oh, uh, let me ask you this. Did anybody tell you you could go to college? In elementary school? Elementary, high school, or otherwise? High school, high school yes. That um, I can tell you that there are only a few people from the community where I grew up that went to college. But when I was growing up, I, was, I had a godmother who was a nurse who lived in New York. And she always encouraged me from the time that I could write letters back and forth to her um, to go to college. I just didn't see it as a possibility because of my immediate circumstances. And I did not perceive that as saying, I will help you go to college. It was just like, what do you wanna do? But the expectation was there. My mother who only had a fifth grade education, not because she was a dropout, but because that's all that was available to her. Oh, really? But, yeah, that they only had, um, and I'll tell you more about that, even with what I'm doing now, that yeah. um, the building that I'm in at the Excelsior High School, was built because the people in the St. Augustine community, which was St. John's County, which is the same county where my mother went to um, school, they did not provide high school education for black students. Really? Oh, no, not until 1925 was when that school was built. And so um, my mother, who you know was a great deal older, she was born in 1917, she only got to go to the fifth grade. And of course, she lived in a very rural area at the time. And But she read the newspaper every day. Floyd can tell you she was very literate that she insisted that, you know, we go to school. Now, I'm not saying that all of my siblings took her up on that, but education yeah. was very important to her because she didn't have not have the opportunity to have it. So it was always like not necessarily you're going to go to college because uh, basically I had to pay my own way through yeah. school. Like I had somebody, I went because I wanted to go. I got a question yeah. to ask, and I don't mean no disrespect. When you got a fifth eighth grade education, you said she read the newspaper, but what deficiencies did that mean she had, if you don't mind? Not her, but just anybody who only had them. We ain't got to say her in particular. Mm -hmm. Anybody who only had a fifth grade education. Get, give you an example. Does that mean that I can only interpret so much. That means that things go over my head. That means that I have, I don't know. I, I'm, let me stop right there. But what does that mean? So I, I think it depends. And I, 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 I know where you're coming from. Right. Because, you know, my, 
when I look at, and I've been looking at ancestry stuff for my grandparents, because I'm trying to do some work on that. And they could both read and write, but I don't think that they had been to school. So um, I think when there's a strong desire that you um, are able to, to um, take advantage of whatever opportunity comes your way. Because there were people who were born in slavery that, that figured out how to do things. It didn't I love mean, it, yes. It just meant that they were not formally educated. So I think there's a difference when we say a person is ignorant because they didn't have an opportunity for an education as opposed to somebody that's just ignorant because they don't want to do any better. Love it, there you go, that's it right there. Okay, just one more on this one then. How uh, uh, did growing up, you knew your place in life though. You knew that the white people was on that side and you were on your side. You couldn't go over there and play on their side couldn't play in that playground, whatever, whatever. Pretty much, but like I said, it was in the country. So the lines were not as harshly drawn as they are in some maybe um, urban type setting because um, when we were playing and if we went to the white ballpark, which was, we lived kind of in the middle of the two, to be honest with you. Okay. That black ballpark was on one end of the street and then we go to the other end and turn the corner and there was another park. And the times that we went there in the week in the summertime when there was nobody there, there, nobody came and said, no, you can't come on this park. So, but when we wanted to go and play a, a, a ball game or something like that, we went to the park that was designated for our community. I got, like, I got one more question on this because I, I like it and I appreciate you doing it. Did, did you ever run into something where they said, hey, you black kid can't do that? Like you got in the swimming pool and they said, oh, we all got to leave because there's a black kid in the swimming pool, anything like that. No, I, I really never had that experience. Okay. Maybe I was, I, my, my, my years when I was exposed to that, being able to a communal kind of thing was actually right after the civil rights movement. So they couldn't do it because we actually were um, bus again to this pool um, from Mandarin all the way to Hendricks Avenue pool where we were given swimming lessons and all of this stuff. So there was an effort because there was no public pool in the community where I grew up. And so that was something that was done. So that was a, kind of a positive uh, experience because we were able to reap some of the benefits of the civil rights movement. Um, I don't, I can't say the only time I've ever had somebody tell me you can't do something. I had a teacher in high school, um, when I said I was going to be a writer and she laughed in my face. Really? Yeah. And, um, she said, um, she just said, you can't, I don't know. She just laughed at me and basically saying, you can't write a sentence. You know, well, you know, went to the University of Florida as a journalism major. And, um, you know, I, there you go. I, you know, I write every day. I haven't written that novel yet, but, you know, I've written some successful grants and I'm still doing that. So I guess somebody can understand something that I write and doing a lot of other writing. I, I, I got one more question. I'm sorry. Oh, to, to be under the conditions that you grew up, to succeed as you hire, means that you have to have what? A lot of tenacity and fortitude inside of you to overcome that, to know that I'm gonna go to college, I'm gonna become something, I gotta pay for it myself. What kind of person does that make, does that say of your character? Well, I think I've always been very determined and very independent. I had, I worked from the time I was 13. I had a job babysitting some kids that were like nine or 10, you know, so I was still a kid. So, and then at, at 15, you know, I had a steady job throughout high school. I saved my money. I bought my own first car, you know? And so it was, it was always like, I need to do better. Cause I need to, I've always wanted better. I've always wanted to improve. I love it. So this led into, so where did you, where did you get the desire to do black history? Well, I've always um, had uh, interest in Black history, but um, 
And that is kind of, and I just made this statement today, which is kind of unusual that uh, I was talking to one of the, one of my staff members and I said, if I had stuck with my interest in black history before, I would probably be a very renowned historian by now, but I did not. My first, I always read, my sisters read and they always had books and stuff, you know, um, so I read whatever you could get when you lived in the country. That's the other thing you do. You have a lot of time. So you read, but we didn't have a lot of books. So, you know, you, and I was, I lived a long ways from the library. So it wasn't like, in you know, you could just go to the library and check out a book. So, um, you know, we had stuff like Richard Wright and, you know, other stuff, but I read this book uh, in, I don't know, it's in 19, maybe the seventies when I was in junior college. Um, it's called Jubilee by Margaret um, Walker. And uh, I might've been 19. I had a, I took an African-American studies class when I was in junior college and I had this awesome teacher. Um, and she shared a lot of information that wasn't in history books. Right. Really. And so it was just like, she had a couple of books that she was able to uh, refer us to that we use kind of as textbooks, but it wasn't something you were getting in other classes. And that was one of the books that she recommended that we read, that we read. And it was, um, I picked it up and I read it all, you know, dur during the summer. It's one of those books I did check out of the library because it was a big, thick book and I couldn't afford to buy it. But I checked it out of the library and I remember just, lying out on a blanket in our front yard and not being able to put that book down. And it's about 700 pages, the original, you know, hardback version of that book. But it was an epic, a lot like Roots. And um, okay. it's, a, it's an awesome book. Um, um, you know, she's an awesome writer, or, you know, um, but- um, And it that, just opened your eyes. It opened my eyes. Plus, you know, in um, uh, the, the class that I took, if I had stuck with that, Dr. Brown was talking about the black Seminoles and the, the, the people who found freedom, who came to Florida, who were escaping slavery in the Carolinas. And, um, you know, I think I've ran, I've ran into a couple of people maybe over the course of my life that I, you know, who labeled themselves as black Seminoles. And then after college, actually, I took some more classes in college. And then I worked for a black newspaper here in Florida. Okay. It was my first um, a newspaper job. And well, it's not my first, but it was like, you know, for after college job. Sure. And um, so I did that for a few years and learned a lot of history. And then I kind of burned out a little bit and, you know, newspapers didn't pay any money. Yeah. So it's like, you, it's hard to survive, especially as a, a, a single person trying to pay rent and yeah, you sure, got to have a sure. car if you live in Florida you got to eat you got to do a whole bunch of things yeah sure so so, so what as, as Floyd told me what happened was you all saw this museum and it was closed at the time it wasn't exactly closed but it was pretty close it was open I think they had two days a week when they were scheduled to be open but if you didn't make an appointment you know you, you know, it was always locked. You really couldn't get in. So Floyd invited, somebody invited Floyd to get involved, one of our friends, because they were looking at, you know, somebody tried to do a, an in run on the, on the, on the, on the on a building. And the building itself is historic. Okay. And so it had been saved from demolition by the community back in the uh, late eighties. Okay, was, that, hold on. Before you do that, let's go back before that. Who opened the museum in that building? What, okay. What's the start of that museum? So it had two starts before Floyd and I. And one was a man who started a museum, didn't do too well, and ran into some difficulty. So then uh, the second person, which is a continuation, the same organization that we are a part of today, uh, was started by a man who was the first and last black superintendent of schools here in St. John's County. His name is Otis Mason. And Otis Mason and a group of people, mainly educators, came together and formed the Friends of Excelsior. The, the school is the Excelsior High School. 
It was built in 1925. It was first called, you know, high school, the color school number two. They didn't even give it a name. And, um, <laughs> you know, but I, that's kind of, you know, school, they do that now, but usually they name them before they open. Yeah. It didn't get a name until 1928. So that tells you it was like, you know, oh yeah, I'll go over there to the color school. So um, they started the Friends of Excelsior. And at some point, I think 2012, they changed the name to Friends of Lincolnville. So that's the organization that Floyd's the president of. I uh, walked into the museum one day because he invited me to go with him to a meeting. And I walked in and I was looking around and I was like, wow, this place needs some help. What can I do to help? And I didn't realize it, but I was saying it out loud. <laughs> And I was okay. saying it to somebody that, because I didn't know, you know, what the situation was there. Now, now hold on. Let me stop you. When you said need help, it had some exhibits on the walls. It no, just needed. Actually, it had no exhibits on the walls. It had one, we had two pictures on the wall, but most of the exhibits were in showcases. Okay. And so, you know, as a matter of fact, I had somebody say to me, you know, we can't put anything on the walls. Well, what do you mean you can't put anything on the walls? It's a museum. Well, that was later. So now it's like the walls are covered. Every you know, I've redone the whole thing. But um, I said this place needs some help, and it did need help. It was just kind of like um, it was derelict, to be honest with you. I got you. And so um, you know, we came in, we cleaned it up. We um, I found you know opportunities to write grants. And then somebody told us about a grant that we could do where um, one of us could resign from the board and write a grant for capacity building and become the director for the museum. So I resigned at that point when I learned about that. And for a year, I went from being the acting event coordinator to the acting director. And so we found out that we got the grant. That was three years ago. Um, that we got that grant that just ended a short while ago. And we um, were able to hire um, an assistant director. We were able to hire a communications person. I love and, it. You know, we've had, you know, a turnover, but now we have a staff that we're up to a staff of four. Um, okay. And so we have... Um, one young lady who uh, has a master's in history that's working with us and another one who has a, um, a, a art history um, degree. Okay. And we have another young lady who we just hired as kind of like the front desk person because yeah. we need to be able to do um, our yeah. other things. Yes. So. And, and so, um, and, and, the, and the building was the old high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and and which is in the black neighborhood. Yep. And the black neighborhood is called Lincoln Lincolnville. It's called Lincolnville. And when it first started, it was called Little Africa, and it was an area of the city of Saint Augustine that dates back to well, I don't know how much you know about the history of Saint Augustine, but it dates back to 1565. Actually, we have recorded um, history of Blacks coming here as early as 1513, some um, free and some enslaved, mainly um, Blacks who came with the Spaniards and fought with the Spaniards against the French, and there were Blacks that came with the French. So Florida has all kinds of history of Blacks being here in the, in the 1500s and, you know, early, late 1400s, rather, and the okay. early 1500s. And so um, the first recorded birth of a black child here goes back to, um, you know, I think 16, oh, no, um, yeah, 1606 or 1609. I was just reading that today. Okay. So um, there's a lot of history here. So what we have done is we've, we've taken this building, which was gonna be torn down because after the schools were desegregated, you know, they did it across America where most black schools were closed and repurposed for something else. Right. School was repurposed a few times for offices and different things. It's Floyd making noise in the background. Yeah. <laughs> so, so now uh, you all were telling me of uh, uh, a great opportunity uh, 
a grant op matching fund something yeah. tell us so, about that so that we all can support this call yeah so let me just put it a little bit in the context of where we are okay right. so, as i said we um did the capacity building grant which helped us to um, hire some staff and organize reorganize the museum so that it has a professional look it has a professional operation and so forth so then a few years ago, I wrote a, a grant into the National Park Service, which we were awarded, which was for infrastructure repairs, which started, um, I guess, a month or so ago that we, you know, just started on um, construction for that grant. But obviously, it's not enough money for a building that's almost 100 years old. So we are, our, our goal is to restore the building in terms of historic preservation of it, but also to upgrade all the systems so that it's 21st century operational. That includes, you know, doing a lot with interior spaces, restoring the original, um, it was a Mediterranean style building when it was first built with okay. tile roofs and uh, a, a shell dash coquino uh, stucco finish, which was pretty, um awesome at the time it was a part of like a building boom in the 1920s so it's a, you could say it's a renaissance kind of building but it has um been used for different things different offices over time and then it was boarded up for a long time and it was going to be torn down yeah so this group um went to the um to the local um city and asked for the building and they were given a lease, but the lease was an as is lease. So then I think they went to the county and they got a small grant to do some renovations and they started the renovations, which is what became the museum, which opened in 2005. Right. And in that um, renovation, it was like, they put together a photographic exhibit, but it was like snapshots and things that, you know, um, either, um, uh, small yearbook pictures or the largest picture that was in there was a eight and a half by 11 Okay. You know, in a museum, in a building it's 18,000 square feet. So Ooh, whole, that's big. Yeah, it's a school. And so the whole building was not used. Most of the first floor is used as a museum when we came in. And then we've entered into a lease with our local um, school district, which rents a part of the building for their pre-K admin. And that's become kind of like a, it was an income stream when the building was like, like I said, it was like on its way out. Yeah. The lights about to get cut off. Right, 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 right. That kind of stuff. So it was able to keep it going. So what we've done is Floyd and I sat down with our board and figured out what are some income streams that we could develop for this museum to help it to, to, to grow and to be able to become self-sustaining. So we, um, at that point, there were no regular hours. So that's the first thing we did was regular hours. And then we said, we need to charge people. So we started out charging people $5 and we we're like, you know, it will be forever trying to do anything with $5. So we changed it to $10 and we're still at $10. I mean, we may change it again because we're still cheaper than any other museum in town. And most of them are just tourist attractions, to be honest with you. Okay. There are very few real history museums that are here, and most of the ones that are, or um, supported by the state or some other uh, uh, government entity. So um, we have an opportunity. The state of Florida has put together a grant package, a set aside, for lack of a better word, for African American museums throughout the state of Florida. This package has, I think, thirty-nine million dollars. $30 million in it. And we have 39 African-American museums throughout the state of Florida. Most of them are much smaller than we are. So what they've done is they've created a grant program where you can get, if you qualify and you do the whole grant process, a $500,000 non-matching grant, which still would not be enough to do all of the things that we need to do for this museum. So you could get another 500,000, which is up to a million dollars, if you raise half of everything you need over 500,000. So our goal is to raise the $250,000, which would be the half of the other 500 to get the million dollars. That way we could redo the roof, redo the elevator, 
the elevator, we got an estimate we were going to do it with this program we're doing. The elevator itself costs $100,000 because it has to be replaced because it's over 30 years old. We have um, another space that we use, which is a kind of a money-making um, area of the museum, and we haven't done anything to that room. So we want to totally restore that room and then you know restore the roof. A lot of things that we cut out of our current grant because in the midst of COVID, when we were ready almost to get started, we had to delay everything. Sure, sure. Prices, everything went up. So we had to cut out a lot of things that, um, and, you know, not really cut corner, but prioritize what's the most sure, important I understand. Thing for us to do. So we want to be able to offer a space that is a, a community cultural um, it's a museum and cultural center. So the upstairs part, what we're working on right now is just to make it functional because we, like I said, we have one big room up there that we do our jazz shows in. And then um, I have an office up there and we have a couple of other offices and some archives up there. But we had a half of the um, second floor that because of water damage and other things that they started demolition long ago, but there was no um, right. instruction. So what we've done over the past few years was with the help of uh, volunteers, and we've been very fortunate. We've had some good volunteers to come and work with us. We used our funds to buy material for replacing the lights and you know the security and you know just kind of like making the existing HVAC system work so that we can occupy that part of the building so that the fire marshal- Okay, I got you. In there, and that's, we make, I call it make and do. We've been yeah. making it. Yeah. But now it's time to make it into what the community deserves for it to be because it is, um, the history is so rich and everybody that comes there, you know, it's like we get comments like, wow, I never knew all of this happened here. I didn't have any idea that this kind of history was here. Okay. I love it. So, so what you, so what it is, you get, you got, I, I mean, I'm not trying to get into semantics. What you want people to do is donate money to the, the museum yeah. through uh, cash app, through the website, so on and so forth. Right. So we have a website and there's a um, donate button on there that will take them to like um, donor box, I think, or PayPal. Okay. I think connected on there and they could do it directly that way or they could the, the issue is um the the state set this up and they only gave us like we just got the grant last week so it was like less than six week turnaround to be honest with you that they kept saying oh we were trying to write the criteria we we're writing the criteria and the people wrote the criteria so tight that it's just like you got to almost be ready to submit your grant by the time the grant opened up, to be honest with you. Okay. So um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity for this museum. Now, would, 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 a, would a corporate donation be a part of the money you are raised that they have to match? Right. So um, what, we're, what we're trying to do, we're still trying to find some other corporate partners like that where we can say they'll match every dollar that you give. But right now we're just reaching out to, to people in general and saying whatever we can raise over that 500,000 that is like the guaranteed amount that they will give you up to that amount that we can get, we can double that by raising more money. And uh, give us the name of the museum again. It's called the Lincolnville Museum. The website is lincolnvillemuseum.org. Okay. Actually, it's Lincolnville Museum and Cultural Center, but it's lincolnvillemuseum.org. Is there a time that you have to have the matching money in place? It has to be in place when we file the grant on November 30th. So we're trying to get um, people to, you know, make their donations, you know, at least like the 28th, 29th, and, you know, have it there. Because so you got 30 days, let's say, because yeah. uh, yeah. today is November 1st. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, all right, uh, everybody. This is Anthony Brown. <laughs> Man, I tell you, I must be growing because people are asking me to help them. <laughs> oh my God! Hey, you got You know, I got no problem somebody. with it because I tell you, Floyd is my guy. See what uh, whatever this channel can do to help, and then I'm coming down there next year.
And and what I'll awesome. do is I'll come down and I'll try to get 500 people to meet and we're going to hang out at the museum. That'd be great. Anthony, yeah, that would be wonderful. That's we okay. Love. I got that. Boom, shakalaka. We're going to put it. You you tell me the date. I got my one event in May. But uh, if you want to do it sooner than that, you tell me when and I'll put it on the calendar. And and there it is. And then we'll we'll have like a weekend. We'll party one night tour the city the next day, have have a picnic and enjoy it because uh, it's going to be good to do because it's going to be cold here and warm there. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, let's, you tell me when you want to do it. Let's make it happen. Everybody, this is what I do. I, I Oh, man, I, I'm so more excited even now. Um, uh, everybody hit the subscribe button on the channel. Hit the like button on this video because I'm telling you, she shared some personal things. Everybody, <laughs> tell somebody about strong inspirations. Uh, you know, send some money down there to that museum. I, I'm I'm sure they'll take twenty dollars, fifteen dollars, whatever that gets towards the goal, and it, it moves them uh, further off the line. Do that. All that information will be in the in the description. Um, and to you, Floyd, and to you, Gail Phillips, I say this with all sincerity. I want both of y'all to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. Y'all champions, y'all foot soldiers in that community and around the world as people watch this video and people who know both of y'all. Thank you. Thank you. No problem. With that, I'll say bye-bye. We out. All right, good night. Good night.